down to 136. Last week I reported 147, and the one week positivity rate is down to 4.6, and last week I reported 5.8. The details about the new uh, vaccinations on that, the Pueblo Mall site are available on the city's website um, and or will be and available on the Pueblo Department of Public Health and Environment's website. Um, there has been um, eight days of stabilized hospitalization patients at Parkview in the past week. We have an ARPA update, but only with respect to what's on the agenda this evening. Um, there are three um, um, ordinances in first reading, uh, the fuel and iron ordinance, um, and then two of the history connections, Rosemont and Bessemer Historical Society, and then Southern Colorado Youth Development. And um, upon council's request, they are all on the agenda on, under separate ordinances um, in N1, 2, and 3. There is also an ordinance, uh, excuse me, a resolution of Q1, and that is additional uh, a request for approval from council um, to use lost revenue and government services uh, for two items that I will present um, at item Q1. And that's all for ARPA. Um, depending on your um, approvals um, next week, I will forward then updated balances um, after the approvals this evening and next, um, I'm sorry, in the following week with um, once you've decided on those ARPA requests. Um, the small business census track program is going to take staff a couple of weeks um, to get the data that you um, that for the for the ordinance to put in place. But I will send you a listing of the small businesses um, in each of the categories of restaurants and taverns, rentals. Um, our, our tax department's working on getting those to you um, in a in a better format than I think the budget committee saw them in uh, last Friday. Those will be out uh, tomorrow or next day. Um, I have one other update, and that is in preparation of discussion of the 2023 budget, the non-departmental books that all of the non-departmental requests were submitted are at your, I call it a desk, I'm not sure, at the dais in your space uh, effective this evening, and, and either in the first page or, or on the left-hand margin, um, you'll see where there is some trend analysis um, provided from 2020 moving forward. The mayor has been through each of the recommendations by review and uh, work with staff and his recommendations to city council are in the second column um, from the right. Um, with still some outstanding questions, you'll see a question mark on, on a couple different items. And then the, the city council budget committee met last Friday afternoon and they reviewed each item as well. Any different item from what the mayor recommends is referenced in the um, uh, budget committee's recommendations and um, the budget committee then is, is prepared to have discussion and conversation. Uh, the first uh, date that there is an agenda item set to review them all and for the presentation from the mayor is Monday, October the 3rd. So there are, there's some time between today, September the 12th and October the 3rd. So send any questions um, either budget committee's way or into the office and we can, you know, we can gather any information you'd like um, before the October 3rd um, presentation. And for the rest of the city updates, I'd like to turn it over to city clerk, Marissa Stoller. She has some updates on the agenda center. And when she is finished, it does conclude city updates and then we're open for questions and any direction. Thank you. Okay, Let me pull this up here. Yeah, it actually is really usually hard to hear. You want to is the gain the gain there? Okay, um, I think that's at least helps people um, on the computer hear me. So I'll just speak loudly to the rest of the room, and hopefully the people on the computer will be able to hear too. Um, Okay, so we have uh, made an update to the Agenda Center and it's going to go live to the public uh, tomorrow. And um, basically this is gonna look very, very similar. This is just an update. This is not a brand new program. And um, essentially you'll see very similar to uh, what it's looked like in the past. Um, we'll have the, the city council work session item. People are able to click and it'll bring up a digital version of the agenda um, that has, you know, the items, any of the documents that are attached to it, uh, they'll be able to review it. Uh, they can also look at the printed version of the agenda um, and it'll kind of come up with a more updated format 
that we've uh, been working on. It won't look exactly like this. It will it will be slightly different, but it'll be kind of a more abbreviated version um, with most of the same information that you would usually see. And it will have all the same um, files and access. Uh, what will be really cool for the public is that for the actual city council meetings, it will have the um, pretty much a live vote uh, going on for it. So all as I'm entering things for the record for the minutes, it'll actually have an M and that'll let you see the motion, like who made the motion, who made the second, and then it'll have a V in there and it'll uh, let you see how people voted. So if you come in late to the meeting, you're watching it on Facebook, your items already passed, you don't know how it is, you'll be able to go live to the website and take a look at it and you'll actually be able to go and look at your item instead of having to wait until the next day. Um, it'll be unofficial. Uh, until the minutes are approved, obviously, uh, but you'll people will be able to kind of get a good a good view of what's going on without having to backtrack through the video or anything like that. So it's our hope that this will kind of help make everything more accessible um, to the public. So that's the the public portal of it, um, and then we will also be um, showing a little bit of this board portal, and this will be for um, department heads and for city council. And basically, um, you can see we've got some um, meetings in here. This is what the um, city councilors will be able to see. So you'll go in and you can see, again, a kind of digital version of the agenda. You can also go and look at a PDF um, agenda or a PDF packet that's got the, both the agenda and all the items. And um, a couple interesting things in here. You can click on to this um, and you can you know, star this item. If there's something that you want to, you know, address, this will be mostly not for work session, but for the actual city council meeting, you'll have all the items there, all the details. Um, so you can see here's the, the PDF that Pueblo Water um, would have done with their presentation today. So you can click that and actually see their whole presentation. And then um, you can make annotations in here. Uh, there's tools for that. You can highlight, um, items, you can circle items, um, anything you want in the PDF and all the things that you're doing stays private to you as a counselor. So um, because we don't want any, you know, sharing of information with the council that's not open to the public. So um, all this stays private to each individual um, council member and you can write your own private notes in here too. Um, so if you wanted to, you know, ask about XXX, you know, um, you can, those are auto saved. And then when you go back to the main agenda, uh, you can see you've got your star on the one that you wanted. And you can also go down here to your notes section. And um, I think it's hard to tell with the zoom underneath here if this is actually what I'm seeing here. Ooh. Okay, yeah, notes section. And it'll show you um, any notes that you took for that work session. So you could see, oh, on the Board of Waterworks, it says ask about you know, such and such. So just a quick primer on that. Um, if you do want more information, happy to answer any questions about this. So um, you'll see this for the September 26th agenda. Uh, we'll start having information and details in the board portal for that. And then, like I said, um, tomorrow, we're gonna be launching this uh, live version here um, for the public. And they'll be able to come over here, see the agenda, the packet, the, the notice and then also the events memo that has all the events that city councilors are, are going to will all be um, here and accessible in the same sort of way that it has been in the past. Happy to answer any questions about the new system if you have any. Great job, Kirk. Uh, what questions are there? I have a question. Councilor Winner. You know, I didn't see the event for Korea on um, the uh, councilors' uh, um, events. I would assume that that's because there's not going to be more than a quorum for that. the the the, the events memo. My is question is, what are they doing in Korea? Either either one, uh, Madam President. We the mayor and I got invited to go visit CS Winds, and I declined and gave Dennis my invitation. They went with uh, Patty Javik and the dean from. PCC to uh, CS Winds is thinking about opening uh, another plant here. So they went to go tour and discuss. Uh, that was kind of mumble. Uh, so CSU is what? No, CS Winds. Okay, is what? Is possibly looking to open another 
to expand their their project here. And so we were invited to go out there and visit with them. From, from the meetings I attended with the mayor, um, CS Winds is looking at expansion at four times the growth of their current employment base and their current sales base. And um, President Graham is right there wanting to build an entirely um, additional uh, plant quickly opening by next December in order to uh, maintain competition with uh, the international market. And from Colorado and why they selected Colorado's location is, as I've listened to in the meetings, they have access by rail um, both to, the, to Canada and to Mexico, as well as the entire United States. So their sales base is, is planning to quadruple. So I heard, for example, they wanted to hire 172 new employees by December the 31st of 2022 and have brought on 105 as of last week, starting salary at $20 per hour without any um, prior experience, and they would um, put them through the training program. So with all the expansion and then including, a, I don't know how many acres, Heather, if you could help me, President Graham, of a new um, um, solar farm heading further east of their current site, they um, were holding their annual meeting or their annual gathering and extend the invitation to President Graham and the mayor. Ms. Stoller, for the um, for the portal, do do counselors have to make a an account to access that? Uh, yes, I did send out an email um, last week uh, saying that hopefully you would have gotten the email. Um, I know that uh, there was at least one counselor that replied that they hadn't gotten it. So if that is the case and you don't see um, either that email from me describing what you should look for in that email, uh, just just email me and I'll make sure that you get um, a password reminder sent to you and you can um, set up your account. Because I and uh, I'm also happy to have anyone come into my office, and I'm happy to help you set it up in person, um, whether you want it on your own private um, uh, computer or one of the the ones that's provided to council. I'm happy to help make sure that that's set up, and also I'm happy to go over the um, online voting system too um, with anyone uh, if you'd like to come in for that. I know that we pretty much have that set up yet, but it has yet to be used because people have been here and uh, not on Zoom, but. If anyone is planning on going on Zoom, I'm happy to, to show you how that works to the Confero um, online system for online voting while people are via Zoom. So we're not taking the roll call vote every time. Um, are we going to be able to access the online voting system through our iPad or do we have to have a laptop? Uh, it does not work on Mac devices. Okay. So you would be able to access it via an Android tablet um, and possibly an Android phone even. Uh, as long as it has a, a, a camera, um, because that is one of the requirements of the system since it is a secure voting platform. Um, but it would have to be um, a, a, a not a Mac device, not an Apple device. So we'll have to get, if we have Mac devices. We'll I do have, have a get... loaner laptop that's available. Um, mm -hmm. So if you know that you're going to be gone, you can come borrow one from my office um, and we'll get you all set up and, and ready to go. And then um, we'll just uh, rent kind of like a, a borrow out for the time that you'll be gone. And then have that one laptop available to other counselors. Great, thank you. Councilor Martinez Ortega. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Ms. Stoller, I think this agenda center update was is gonna be phenomenal for uh, this the community to have uh, open and transparent um, availability to, I guess, just see the information that we see in real time. So thanks for working on that. Other questions or comments? Ms. Solano. I'm so sorry, I forgot one important matter, and that is the city attorney is attending this evening via Zoom. If you saw him there, he is um, um, practicing the appropriate protocol uh, while ill with COVID. Councilor Graham. Uh, Ms. Solano, on Friday we had talked about the trash budget um, with Parks and Rec. Can we get that on a, a work session so he could come in? present to us about what we had discussed for the full time? We certainly can, Madam President. Let me let me look to see if um, um, a non-televised night that might have a longer opportunity, and we'll add it to the very next one. We talked about a, uh, a, a trash budget and with uh, President Graham's direction uh, to work with um, uh, Parks and Rec, who has submitted a budget uh, for full-time and or part-time individuals. Um, and tonight, one of the um, resolutions for the art use of ARPA funds will be a specific trash truck. So getting our ducks in a row for aligning for 
increase in um, opportunities to pick up trash in the city. Thank you. And then I don't know if this is the appropriate time, but um, we had talked about maybe combining some of these budget work sessions to one night instead of drawing it out over three or four weeks. I don't know how everybody else feels about that. Um, so we would be here a little bit longer, one or two nights instead of coming three or four times to discuss, discuss the budget. So if people are on board with that, I think Ms. Solano will rearrange the, the schedule and let us know how it would look either way. Just so we can have like the information all together instead of weeks out. So we're not forgetting or being sidetracked on what we looked at the previous week. I think that's important. Mm -hmm. I'm good with that. Councilor Martinez Ortega. Yes. Councilor Graham, Councilor Atencio, Councilor Maestri, Councilor Winner. Cool. That's a great idea. Moving right along then. Any other thoughts or comments for this first agenda item? Seeing none, um, our friends at Board of Waterworks had um, something come up. So they are postponing their Board of Waterworks presentation until later on. And um, so our next then or order of business is an update from the Nature and Wildlife Discovery Center. So can I have Ms. Driver and Mr. Spar to the podium, please? Hello. Is this on? Been six months since I came and promised you that I would uh, bring Taylor Driver to meet you because she was appointed as our executive director but hadn't taken the reins of the organization yet. And here she is. And so I'd like to introduce Taylor Driver. She's been uh, in position there and in doing a great job and she's going to carry on with the rest of the program. Hi, good evening. There we go. All right. <laughs> Tech is, um, we are a nature organization, so tech is not always the, the strong suit. Um, we, we have a PowerPoint coming. All right, um, as many of you know, we're the Nature and Wildlife Discovery Center. Um, our organization is all about promoting environmental stewardship and community health. And we do that through three ways. Um, we have our nature education, which we're probably best known for. We have our wildlife rehabilitation. And then we also promote outdoor recreation because we are on two public properties. I need to head this way. There, oh, I'll there we go. Nope. All right. Um, so this is this is our team. Um, right now, um, our full-time team um, on here, just so you can see some of the faces that make all of the wonderful work that this organization does. Um, we are missing on here 11 part-time staff who are in the field, either through guest services or our environmental educators and a raptor technician um, who helps Diana Miller care for our wonderful raptors. Um, so, our beautiful faces, they have made my job so much easier as I kind of transition into this role. Um, but as many of you might know, we manage our two campuses. We have our mountain campus and our river campus. Our mountain campus is 611 acres of property that butts up right against US Forest Service and is about eight miles of trail access that dives right into many more miles of U.S. Forest Service land. And one of the goals of our organization as we move forward is to really activate those that trail system so that we can better activate the entire trail system in that part of Colorado. Um, we also have our numerous wonderful lodges and pavilion. Um, and we just have, we're, full the next couple months every weekend. Um, so we've been working hard as a team to make sure that those spaces are filled, um, whether it's weddings or retreats. Um, and now that school has started up again, our forests during the weekdays are filled with kids <laughs> coming in and out um, with earth studies, our fifth graders coming up for the first time 
um, next Monday. And then we have our river campus, which recently has experienced some unfortunate flooding, um, but it is for the most part an oasis in our city um, right along the river boasts phenomenal recreational opportunities for our anglers, bikers, walkers, and is home to our outdoor education program, which serves about 52 homeschool students um, throughout the week, every week for the whole school year. Um, it is also home to our Earth Keeper Nature School, which is our preschool kindergarten for two days a week. Um, and so it is being activated as now that it has been restored a little bit from the floods that we did experience in large part, thanks to the support we did receive from city. Um, Stephen Meyer and Mike Taft got their team down there to really help us get in, get that dirt <laughs> that flooded through that area out. And it's been much better since. And we are looking at some long-term solution problems with with the city parks and rec department to kind of figure out how to how to mitigate that in the future. <laughs> um, but one of the fun things I will share about our river campus is we are in the process of developing a nature kids discovery zone. Um, a handful of years ago, another flood washed out a playground and that has been sorely missed in the community down there. Um, and we recently received funding from the Colorado Health Foundation to do a community planning grant um, to figure out how we're going to build that space um, up in a way that will really serve and activate our Pueblo community, not just for our little kids, but for, for adults as well. Um, and we'll be working and bringing Steven into that to kind of explore where that's gonna go. And that starts next, the first meeting for that is next week. Um, part of our river campus is our wonderful Raptor Center. You might see someone you recognize up in this <laughs> in that photo. Uh, Mayor Gratisar did release a juvenile red-tailed hawk recently. Um, and if any of you are ever interested in being a part of a bird release, we're releasing them regularly, especially right now. So just let us know. Um, we'd be happy to have you out. Um, but this is, we are the only raptor center in Southern Colorado. And we care for around 300 birds annually that we work to release. Um, and that is largely thanks to Diana Miller, who was just a, a staple in this community and in wildlife rehabilitation. Um, and the wonderful volunteers that pour a lot of their heart and soul into providing our raptors with great care, as well as our community with wonderful education. Um, while we serve the Pueblo community, the Raptor Center actually brings people from across the state and out of state to see what is happening in, with our birds and in this facility. Um, our Earth Studies program is in our 20th year right now, and we are back up to three sessions. The last couple of years, it's been a little harder for the organization, largely, and our school system with COVID. Last year, we were able to do two sessions of Earth Studies, and this year we will do three. So we will be bringing every fifth grader in the Pueblo City School District out three times for environmental education, and they will get a chance to experience both our mountain campus and our river campus, as well as, as, well as our raptors. So, um, and this time around, our teachers get a little bit of a choice on the third session. They get to pick what they would, what fits best with the curriculum that they're working on. And our Earth Keeper Nature School is celebrating its fifth year um, of bringing preschoolers and kindergartners out for forest school um, from the start of the school year all the way to the end. Um, we have 47 kids this year who will be in that. And I believe last year they spent a whopping two hours inside during the school year. Um, and so they are, they are playing at both campuses um, and experiencing 
the the joys that come with constant exploration and kind of developing a curriculum for themselves out of their interests and learning risk assessment by and learning how to balance and it's quite it's it's fun to watch um once again if this is something that you would like to see firsthand we would welcome you to kind of explore explore a day with us um, and and these kids and then a newer program with us is outdoor explorations program it's in partnership with the alpine international preparatory academy i know it as aipa um, and it engages homeschoolers from first grade through eighth grade um, and we split them up they come some they come up four days a week um, through the whole school year um, and learn all different types of things based in nature. So it's a, a really good enrichment program. Um, we've seen our numbers almost double from the first year to our second year. So we're close to um, 60 students now who are enrolled in that program. Um, so we would not be able to do what we do in our in our programming or maintaining the the space um, without the support of the city. Um, your funds help us maintain access, high quality access um, to green space for our communities and these programs. Um, but we also know it is our commitment to steward these lands appropriately. Um, and this year we are, or in 2023, um, we're going to continue significant fire mitigation um, up at the historic Pueblo Mountain Park. Um, that's been an ongoing process since 2002 when the Healthy Forest Projects first started. Um, and we're actively continuing to fundraise um, to develop this nature play discovery zone at, at the river campus um, and looking at other ways that we can enhance and develop this, our park system um, to not only the benefit of our programs, but this community as a whole. Um, and so why your continued support and excitement for NWDC matters. Um, we're looking at serving close, just through our programs, likely close to 20,000 um, people in 2023. And we are working on deepening our relationships with the city, with other organizations in the community to really activate the wonder that is our, our recreational hub that we have here in Pueblo that's been, I think, underutilized um, through building up volunteer programs with Southern Colorado trail builders, um, growing our, continuing to grow our outdoor education programs with different partnerships and really looking at how we're developing a pipeline from our preschoolers all the way through our college students on ways to get involved in this field um, and to give back to the community through outdoor education. Questions? And this is Lurch, by the way, if any of you have not met mm -hmm. Lurch the Vulture, he's very well known. <laughs> Well, thank you, Lurch, Ms. Driver, and Mr. Spar for that presentation. What questions are there from council? For the planning grant, um, I'm wondering when the planning will end and the implementation of that plan will begin. Absolutely. So we have to spend down the funds by August 31 um, next year. The hope is that we're, we're gonna push that to about a six month, get that planning really going. Um, we are then eligible to apply for a, a much larger implementation grant, which is our plan um, to get that, that ball rolling. But we're also looking um, just to make sure that we can move, move that along. And the organization has been doing some fundraising and setting funds aside for that particular playground since 2019 and 2020 kind of put 
a hold on on some of those, but we're we're committed to getting this this in the ground and happening. Part of the problem is that the area that used to be the playground that was washed out some years ago uh, continues to wash out. I mean, that's where the flood came this year when we had the monsoon rain. So it's the planning and, and engineering is not quite as easy as planning the playground where it was uh, because it just ends up in the river again. So, uh, you know, <laughs> but we we're, we're scratching our heads and, and hope to have a, uh, help from Colorado Health Foundation. Uh, they're going to be advising. We work are working with Parks and Rec with uh, Stephen especially and you know seeing what we can do to have it be a long-term uh, lasting lasting uh, effect. But the the planning grant does come with the support of a technical advisor, which is is phenomenal and really adds to the value of that grant. So Thank you, Ms. Shriver. What other questions or comments? I have a comment. Councilor Warner. Yeah, I don't have a question. I do have a, uh, just a comment. I had the opportunity to release a bird. So it, it is wonderful. I, I, ad, I highly advise that you all do it. And Ms. Shriver, would that be contacting you? Yes. Um, well, yeah, you're on. There we go. Oh, um, and if you are free this Friday, we do have, we have four juvenile ravens that are going to be released at Mission Wolf um, that you'd be welcome to, but we have a handful of birds coming up. So I can, I can send the schedule. I've sent the schedule to Tracy before. And so it have, yeah, if you're interested, we'd love to have you. Yeah, that'd be great. Cool. I guess one of my other questions, I guess, or a comment was that um, you know, I remember growing up and going to the nature center campus. And at that time it was free parking. And I know that there's recently a change in the past couple of years to pay for parking. I'm wondering if, um, because it's such a great space, it's, it's a, such a great place to come take your family and kids. Do you offer anything for parking for low-income families? Just because if they're frequenting that, you know, that place, it, $5 per time can break the bank a little bit. So what, are you doing anything for low-income families? Right now, we do not have anything in place. However, as we've been looking at these grants um, that are all about equitable access to nature, that is something that has come up a handful of times and our board is entering into our next strategic, our three-year strategic plan. And so that is something that is very much being looked at critically um, as we want to make sure that space is activated by everyone in the community. Councilor Warner. Um, isn't the parking lot state owned? Isn't that the issue of the, of the, the pay? And then I, that's my understanding. I am not sure. Who owns because what? Because that I parking lot that gets city, access to the parking or is city trails. property. Uh, I, I mean, it's it's a combination of mm -hmm. city, state, city, state, park, yeah. uh, But I believe that the majority of the space is is city owned, and of course, all of the mountain park is is city owned. But I believe we do have the. I believe we're in the position to decide whether or not there. Yeah, I don't. I don't know but, why you. But that is it good. On. I will. I will look into that and just make sure. Okay. I thought that was the reason. Decisions. I thought that was the reason that park that paid parking was was implemented because it was state or United States Forest Service. But if we can, it, definitely, if we can just get rid of that parking. I mean, not just low income, but a lot of us don't even ever have cash on us. So you get there and, you know, you don't have. It's, any way it to has pay. been an issue. We had. Uh, a drop box there for years where people were just supposed to put their money mm -hmm. in. Well, vandals came in and I mean, sure. we couldn't, we couldn't keep the box. And right. so then we went to the electronic and, and, and then of course we have to pay for that service. So, I don't, and, and nobody and, gets tickets out there anyway, do no, they? No. So it's just, it's kind of worthless. It's, it's an honor that. system. Right. Yeah. And Taylor and I had lunch together today and that was one of the, one of the things that came up, you know, is, is this a smart deal? And, I think she and I are in agreement that <laughs> that we can, you know, make that go away. And and if somebody maybe put a sign up and say, hey, if you love what you're doing here, become a member or make a donation or Is whatever. that like a wedding? Why are people paying to park or? And oftentimes whatever. if they do rent our space, it comes with a certain number of parking passes. But I think 
I do think that the biggest for me, the biggest thing I think where our organization is looking at the biggest thing is ease of access to this to this public space. Yeah. So. And that's being discussed. So in answer to your question, that's that's one of the things that we think that we need to get away from. Tell him that I said it was stupid. All right. <laughs> My board meeting is next next Wednesday. And so how do we, will, how do we spell that? S T U P I D is okay. All right. Councilor Tencio. Yeah, this is at the Nature Center. Um, paid parking. The at the yes at the River Campus. Yeah. So yeah, the. Well, and, I, I'm with uh, Miss Winter. I, I would support the city paying what you would be making on parking and let it be free to the public because uh, can low income people park up on top of the hill and walk down or do they have to pay? Well, it's it's uh, uh, supposed to, to be paid parking at up on the, on the top of the hill too at the Raptor Center. It's and and if we've eliminated it, we'd eliminate it from all three all three parking areas. I, it would I, be, I say eliminate it. Uh, I, I would be willing to give you more money in your budget to compensate for the parking because that's that's not right. That's good to take. We'll take that to our board next week at our board meeting. I'll be the first to vote yes on that issue. All right. To give you more money. Yeah. The net of that income is is roughly ten thousand a year or or some twelve thousand, which is peanuts in our in our big picture. The low income community in this town is completely shut out of every yeah, they don't, in town. We don't need any more barriers to entry. Thank you. Thank Especially you that. that area, because they should be able to, I mean, it belongs to the city. They shouldn't have to pay to get in. Great. What other, any other questions or comments? Well, thank you so much, Ms. Driver and Mr. Spar for that presentation. We'll be in touch about the bird releases. Yeah, we're going to, I'm going to, I want to release them. Well, thank you for your time this evening. Yeah, don't forget my inv invitation. Anytime you want to come out to any of the campuses, we'd love to give you a tour and show you everything. And yeah, thank you again for your support. What's going on with the telescope there? That's owned by CSU Pueblo. Okay, how do you how do you get into that? I can get that answer for okay, you. Okay, thanks. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how to get up. I mean, I know it's up there, but it's, it, yeah, it's CSUP's uh, facility. Thank you again. Great. So we're going to contact Ms. Driver about the the plant, the telescope and bird releases. Um, our next on the agenda is a CDOT project update. So can I please have Ms. Hugh and Mr. DeHart? Welcome, whenever you're ready. All right. I'm assuming we're watching to see if the presentation comes up. So introductions before we get going. Uh, Joe D. Hart, uh, resident engineer with CDOT and- Ajin Q, uh, SAUCE program engineer. And also we have resident engineer, Laura Johnson in audience. So thanks for inviting us to come and present to city council. It's been quite a while since we've been here talking about the projects that we've been doing in Pueblo and, and wanted to give you an update on what's happening for I-25 and Highway 50, right? Our two fairly major uh, corridors through the town. We're gonna go with I-25 first. And again, if it's too much detail, uh, didn't wanna go too far in detail, but go back and, and relive a little bit of the past to remind some of the newer council members of how the new Pueblo Freeway came about and what some of the steps that have been happening since uh, 2000, really. So we started the, the new Pueblo Freeway project or this idea of rebuilding the interstate through Pueblo because of some of the safety problems that we've got. And so again, a brief history, we started in 2000, uh, ended up with the environmental impact statement, which is the the NEPA document, the environmental document that we created, and then uh, which is the plan. And there was a plan for the north end of town and south end of town. And the other document that we mentioned there is the record of decision. That's actually FH, FHWA, right? The Federal Highway Administration. That's their commitment to funding and building those interstate improvements. So the record of decision is really kind of our more important document to be talking about. Um, one thing that we have to do to demonstrate that we've got this commitment of FHWA is show that there's funding. 
So we look at the next 25 years worth of money that comes into Pueblo, coming in through PACOG. We say, can we afford these projects that we want to do on the interstate? And if we can, then that supports that record of decision. And so going on to the next slide, that's why, um, and I'll go back to that slide. So that's why we did two or have two record of decisions. The current one covers us from the Arkansas River up to the 5047 interchange. When we wanted to do that record of decision, we demonstrated we had enough money coming to Pueblo in that 25 years to build all those projects along there. But we didn't have enough money to go from the Arkansas River south. We always knew that as we were trying to build this all new Pueblo freeway, it was going to be in those two parts. And, and we were concentrating on getting the north end of town built first. Then we could go and concentrate, get the record of decision and build the south end of town. Uh, the only bad thing is that, right, that kind of plan leads us into decades worth of time that passes from when I, we've got our plan done to we're, when we're executing. But again, just a, a brief explanation of that record decision in case it's a term you hadn't run into before or in explaining why it is that we've got one for the north and not for the south. Uh, and it really uh, is about the funding and whether we can show that we've got funding or not. So I was going to go back a slide for a second because we say, well, what do we need to rebuild the interstate for? Uh, and it was reminding uh, folks that the original interstate was like in the late 40s, early 50s, original construction, actually before there was interstate standards, right? Interstate standards like you should have an on and off ramp that's this long so that you could get up to speed or you know, slow down. Um, what kind of curves should they be really tight or really gradual curves so that uh, things aren't so uh, um, uh, dangerous? And so that's what you see in Pueblo are curves that are really tight and on off ramps that aren't right. So that's what the new Pueblo freeway goes to do is make those improvements to try to bring us to these interstate standards that we've got today. So again, right, a little bit of history on new Pueblo freeway, why we started it so long ago and really where we're at today. I forgot to mention, uh, so the purpose and need of the new Pueblo Freeway, right, that environmental uh, exercise that we went through, that NEPA exercise, part of it is you have to have that purpose and need. That is your path moving forward that you're measuring your, your alternatives against and you're trying to figure out how you can do improvements to try to support those, those goals. So safety and mobility was the purpose and need of the new Pueblo Freeway. And as a comparison, you might say, well, if you looked at T-Rex or Cosmix or The Gap, right, a lot of those would have had a capacity, right, uh, 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 for their purpose and need. Maybe not necessarily safety and mobility. So that's something a little bit different in Pueblo that we're trying to get our improvements because of safety and mobility, not because we think we're so congested that we need more lanes. So the record decision that we've got is from the Arkansas River up to 5047, and we're actively working on projects uh, within that footprint. This shows the, the smaller independent utility projects that we can do, and that means that we could do one project, never do anything else, and that one project still has a significant impact it could have on the system. You can tie it into the existing system and not have to, you know, keep chasing your tail. So each one of these has a, a, a defined beginning and end that fits well within the existing I-25. So of these projects, uh, recognize ILEX, and I'll, we'll show that in the next slides, but ILEX was the first project to the south. First to 13th is a large split diamond interchange that connects 13th Street on and off ramps all the way down to 1st Street on and off ramps. The EIS committed that because we were impacting historic properties along the corridor, that one of the major ways we were going to mitigate the impact of those uh, historic properties was to do uh, reconstruction and improvements inside Mineral Palace Park. So we've always identified that as a project, right? You could do just the Mineral Palace Park, nothing else, right? And that has meaningful uh, um, benefit to it. The US 50 project, which again, you, you see from the slides, that's the one we're actually working on now. So we'll get into more detail of that. Uh, there's the Dillon Drive, which was a uh, piece of roadway that you saw in the EIS that really had the mobility component behind it or the mobility driver behind it. 
and looking at the connectivity uh, and trying to get people back and forth in town and not needing to use the interstate as the only way to get from south of town up to north of town. So the Dillon Drive extension was a, a fairly major way to get people from uh, west side of the interstate over and, and get, like to the mall, for example. And then the last is the 29th Street interchange area. And that's really the end of the new Pueblo Freeway. If you go up to the 5047, it was rebuilt you know, quite a while ago, but it was built to the capacity that it still has today. It's got interstate standards, wide shoulders, XLD cell lanes, things like that. So that's the, the projects of the phase one record of decision, the, the northern part of the new Pueblo Freeway. So like I said, we had completed I clicked twice on the clicker. I'm just checking to see if, if there's a lag in my clicks versus the side. So we've got the ILEX project done. That was the reconstruction of the interstate from the Arkansas River up to, Fort, up to First Street, what we're calling City Center Drive. A couple of long viaducts that were there, 800, 900 foot long bridges and rebuilt those so that those bridges are smaller and we did dirt in between, easier to, and cheaper to maintain. Uh, but anyway, that was a successful project, the first one for the new Pueblo Freeway. So we got that done. We said, right, continuing this march of, of how do we keep working through these independent utility projects and get the record of decision footprint built. Our next project uh, identified that fit the right, um, the right features or, or the, right, the, the right fit, right? And, and the reason I say that is the first to 13th project is 220 million. The 50 interchange project is 140. So when you're looking at potential funding sources, you're trying to pair up the projects that match well with those funding opportunities that are sitting in front of us. So right now, Senate Bill 267, and I'm jumping a little bit from the slides, but Senate Bill 267 was our big legislation that was bringing money to us. And so it was looking for a certain kind of project or certain value of project. And that 50B project fit that better than saying, well, since we've got ILEX done, let's just automatically jump to 1st to 13th and march our way north. So we were really looking for the next project because we can leapfrog a little bit, that next project that fit our funding better. The 50B project fit that funding better and, and we're uh, doing it because again, you look at the problems in the area, we've got tight geometry on the on and off ramps that really make large trucks uh, troublesome as far as getting around. We've got a clearance issue on the interstate for that bridge. And it's amazing how many times that bridge is hit with trucks and their loads that are too tall and they bash into those concrete girders and knock concrete away. And, and, and uh, so we've been in fixing that bridge once already to fix some of those damages. Um, but this project will, will correct the bridge height, get it at the right height so we won't have that problem anymore. We've got uh, um, detour routes. Sorry, I was drawing a blank on the word I wanted to use, but it was detour routes. So sometimes the loads uh, can't make it down the interstate because of that bridge. And so they're looking for another way to get through Pueblo. Um, we use currently the old uh, 227 highway, the Joplin Road, to get traffic uh, around the interstate in that low area. So again, that would be another thing that this project fixes is we're able to keep all of the interstate traffic on the interstate, more conducive uh, uh, long vehicles and, 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 and heavy vehicles moving out to Kansas and Kansas in can now use the interchange instead of having to go on 47 around by the airport things like that. So the 50 project has a lot of good benefits that we're going to be able to fix as soon as we're done with construction. I'm not going to go through all the details. Um, just large picture, a, a little bit bigger project than normal because we're rebuilding a section of the interstate and also rebuilding a section of Highway 50. Um, so you'll see from Bonfort to I-25 and then from Mineral Palace Park up to 29th Street. The Highway 50 is the road that has the bridges. Highway 50 crosses the fountain. Highway 50 crosses the railroad tracks and then it crosses I-25. So we're re rebuilding those bridges. Uh, the most interesting thing that we're doing with this project, originally in the EIS, it was gonna be kind of a classic diamond interchange that you see everywhere. 
And that was a decision that they did back in 2006, 2008. And it's amazing in that amount of time how much uh, interchange types have, have changed in the meantime, or that there's been some new ones invented since then. This one that we're doing is called the diverging diamond interchange. And if you want to experience one that's actually alive and, and working up in Colorado Springs at the Fillmore interchange is a diverging diamond interchange. Um, it offers a great uh, amount of operational uh, improvements that we get out of this and move a lot of extra traffic. Uh, and in a nutshell, what it does is it takes left turns that you normally would have to wait for a light and wait for your left turn. Because of the way it works, that becomes just a free movement because you're never put in conflict with oncoming traffic. So operationally, it works really great. If you want to learn and get into that more, we'll come back and, and talk more. But right, just trying to stay high level for you. So that's the cool thing that we're doing with this project is something that's a little bit more innovative as far as the interchange type. So the good news is that um, of the $140 million, we've got a lot of different colors of money that we call it, different different um, um, sources of the money. I mentioned Senate Bill 267, um, uh, RPP dollars, right, or, or our uh, PACOGS discretionary dollars to spend. We've got that in there. Surface treatment, water quality, safety, uh, Bridge Enterprise. Bridge Enterprise is a big financial contributor to the ILEX project. So again, we've got two bridges now that are, are eligible, poor enough to be eligible to get that bridge enterprise funding. Um, we are on track for an uh, FOR, which means that we're about 80% done with our design. We think we're about there in December. So we've been marching along pretty good. We've been designing since early last year. So we're almost two years underneath our belt as far as designing, doing a lot of right-of-way acquisitions. And we think that we're ready for advertisement probably December of next year is what our schedule is looking like. And then we think about two years worth of construction to build it all. So through 24, 25, maybe into 26, I know I've got that slide there. We're not quite looking that far out yet to know whether it's two years, two and a half years. So it's exciting. Uh, Highway 50 project is moving along well. So what does that have us left to do to, to keep going with the new Pueblo Freeway and work within that record of decision footprint is the city center to 13th Street. And as I mentioned, of all the projects left, that's the largest um, valued project still left to be completed. That reconstruction from city center to, first, to 13th is fairly long. A lot of bridges in there, a lot of interstate reconstruction. Uh, Mineral Palace Park, Dillon Drive, and, and 29th Street are projects still to get accomplished in, in Pueblo for that. So if you're thinking PACOG, if you're thinking priorities of, of projects in Pueblo, continue to support I-25 and, and that there's projects still left to do to try to get the new Pueblo Freeway uh, uh, continued to be built and, and, and get this, this north record decision done. Not related to New Pueblo Freeway, but still I-25 work, is this project, which is exit 104. And if you think of the, uh, the Dillon Road, the new project that the city constructed that has the roundabouts, uh, the cool artwork right in on that east roundabout. And then the interchange just to the north of that is the Drew Dix interchange. And so when you built the Dillon Interchange, you completed about three quarters of the work it took to make those two interchanges act like a split diamond interchange. And so what we wanted to do with this project is finish that. And so it was the frontage road on the east side of the interchange, of, of the interstate, sorry, that didn't get built. So this project builds that frontage road on the east side and, and makes that split diamond all complete now. We also looked at the intersections at Drew Dix um, and said that the one in front of the Love's truck stop, especially uh, with the frontage road and the on and off ramp so close, doesn't operate very well. A lot of people go in the wrong directions. A lot of people confused. It, it really could use some help to make it operationally work better. So you see us doing that with this project as well. So we're building a roundabout at the right in front of the Love's truck stop. That, and, and that's actually Elizabeth or, or Drew Dix. It's your street that we're connecting, but we're cleaning up the frontage road, the on and off ramps and making that area work 
operationally a lot better. And then building that frontage road on the east side of the interstate. We think that this project is advertising this year in October. All the money is, is put together. Actually, I take that back. We've got one more budget request to get $3 million into the project and we'll be ready for advertisement. So either uh, end of October, maybe middle of November and uh, construction in the next year for sure. There's a lot of work to do. Um, so probably 23 and 24 before you see all that work done. One more exit to the north of that is some newer interest, some newer conversation that's been happening. Um, and I think it is uh, uh, been in PACOG's conversation for quite some time is the exit 108 where Purcell out of Pueblo West connects to I-25. And, and the, the trouble of this, of the single width box culvert there and, and traffic trying to move through that. So it has been identified in, in PACOG's long-term plan and the 10-year plan to do reconstruction of that interchange. And so we're starting on design work to understand um, what kind of reconstruction that would be, what kind of new bridge we'd put in place. Don't really have anything to tell you quite yet other than just be excited that it's finally made it to the point where we're starting on design and, and going to start working on that. From an I-25 corridor perspective, that's what we've been doing. And Ajin wanted to talk with you about the Highway 50 corridor, uh, both what you see from like Purcell coming to I-25, but also from I-25 going east out past the airport because we're doing a lot of work. So I'll let you talk Highway 50. This one. Yeah, the right side. Mean? Well, what yeah. is this one? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. So, um, about four or five years ago, City Council and PACOG uh, approved uh, approve a resolution and uh, Highway 50 and I-25 are the two priority. So we are working on both yeah, priority. Highway 50, we, in the last 10 years, we spent quite a bit of resources. Um, right current, we did the extension of the third and eastbound lane, and also build up part of westbound lane from Wells Boulevard to uh, the point just past Pueblo Boulevard. So we did a third lane. And the current project is extending the third westbound lane to just past Purcell, and also rebuild the interchange of Purcell and Highway 50. So we are working on that project. Um, let me see if I help. So the project, um, we are building the gray separate interchange. 50 will be above Purcell. Uh, the bridge, you can kind of, you know, visual bridge is almost there. Uh, uh, we should be able to finish up with the bridge work in um, next week or so. Uh, basically, um, waterproofing the bridge and then we'll over we'll paving the 50. Once the 50 is paved and highway, you know, 50 traffic will be on top of the bridge. And then we can finish our Purcell and uh, finalize the project. We should be able to um, you know, get the traffic in its final configuration means Purcell traffic on Purcell 50 on, um, on 50 um, by sometimes November. So people should have, you know, see quite a bit of improvement in uh, November. Um, final, uh, final finish up touch up will be December and January dish. So once that project's done, 50th um, from Pueblo to Pueblo West should be, you know, in in good shape. Then we can shift the uh, resource, the energy to other projects. Yeah. We Okay, currently see that it's working on 50 East from Bamford to the airport. So we are working on res resurfacing the highway and also we're working on several bridges and, in, and also install some ADA ramp, bring the ADA ramp to current standard. Uh, we're working on some change order to add the concrete slope of paving uh, by the railroad bridge. So, um, the slope of paving in bad shape. Uh, we have enough money to um, just uh, work on the west side of the bridge, um, 
repair, remove the you know damage of the concrete super paving and repair that. So that project should be done sometimes in February this next year. Paving, I'm hoping paving is done this year, but super paving will be uh, following that. And that's it. Yeah, have any questions for us? Thank you, Ms. Hu and Ms. Mr. DeHart uh, for that presentation, all that information. What questions are there from council? Council Martinez Ortega. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you both for the uh, presentation. Um, Joe, I think you mentioned, you touched uh, on this briefly, but south of the Arkansas River, what is the plan for that? And when we're gonna start really getting a plan together for that and starting to tackle some of those safety uh, issues that you're talking about? The environmental impact statement came together with a plan for that south. The, the preferred alternative, the one that the, the plan says is the best way to go is realigning the interstate, um, going through the Eilers neighborhood, right? Going, getting into the CFNI power plant, or uh, not power plant, the, the CFNI um, uh, footprint, right, of their facilities. And, and so at the time of that plan, that was really either move it there or keep it on the existing alignment and the benefits, right, versus the, the pros and the cons still show that that realignment was the better way to go. There's been a lot of things that have happened since that plan was put in place. The record of decision hasn't solidified that as FHWA, the federal government's obligation to build that. Um, and so really the, the, the position of it is that if we ever start to show that we've got enough money to go south of the Arkansas River, we probably will have to redo the environmental work again, or at least go back and look at it and say, is that decision that we finalized in 2014, is that still the good and the proper decision that we might make in 2023, if, if that's when we started looking down south? Um, and I think the answer would probably be, well, it makes sense to go back and look at that and then revisit again. So once you start that, who knows if we would continue to find the realignment is the best path or not, or maybe we would come back to rebuilding and widening where the, the uh, interstate is now. So, so that's me dancing around answering you a little bit, right? But that's, uh, once we're ready to start to talk south of the Arkansas River, that's the planning that we would have to do. That's the environmental work that we would have to do. Um, and if there was money identified, that could be in conjunction with getting ready to do some engineering or, or some construction on a project. Um, but even if we said, we're done with the North, it's really time to go look for the South. And, and if we wrote this record of decision that gives us multiple projects in a row, we could go that route as well. So it doesn't have to be triggered just on a pot of money ready to be spent. It really could be looking at saying, the North is done, now it's time to go look at the South. Um, could we have enough money in the next 25 years to cover these projects? If yes, let's get a record of decision done. And that way we're kind of ready to be at the table to talk real money when real money becomes available because we've got a lot of projects that are ready to go. So um, I guess um, ballpark, what would you say would be an educated guess on when you would come up with a record of decision or something like that to start really melding those two, the EPA's um, advisement on realigning the I-25 or the 2014 realignment decision? When, when would you say? The, unfortunately, the answer has still got to be decades away, right? We know that PACOG in their 10-year plan doesn't even have the rest of the projects in the north finished. Um, not that they couldn't decide to go south, right? But I think the intent is to finish the north projects and then go in south. Um, so we don't even have enough money for those, let alone to be looking at going south. So unfortunately, right, and unless there was some surprise money that comes our way, which sometimes there is, if we looked at just normal funding sources, normal gas tax money that comes into Pueblo or legislative things that happen, we're still decades away. I think we should start looking into some equity dollars on places that was, were historically left out um and ultimately damaged um that's why the epa superfund site cleanup and things like that and so as our community starts to see a lot of equity dollars coming socially 
We'll probably start seeing those come in for the infrastructure as well. So please be out on the, be on the lookout because the south end of town is in far worse shape and needs more help than the north end of the county. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I like that. Yeah. You can see that that our um, our 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 connection is through Paycog, and so we can carry that message to Paycog just like you can. And it it is it's it's that it's that teamwork amongst us all to try to figure out where the priorities are, where the money should be going, and and if if that's where it should go, then Paycog will will help find ways to get the money to those projects. Thank you, Joe. Thanks, Ajin. Councillor Maishri. Um, so 108 is just a study, correct, in the 10-year plan? Exit 108? Yes, X108 is on the 10-year plan. Yes, but it's just going to be a, like a study or a engineering. What, it's only a $450,000 allotment, so that obviously doesn't put in an interchange right there. So so 400 something on 490, basically half a million dollars. Is the, it's called RPP money, it's the regional priority money. It's in the project. So we 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 just started the scoping of the project and do survey work and preliminary study. But there are eleven million dollars in transportation plan, and two million will be between twenty three and twenty six, and nine million dollars uh, construction money will be in twenty twenty seven and beyond. So it's eleven million. So even twenty twenty seven to get one oh eight. I just, I just wondering about that because it's been, even though it's not part of the city, it just burdens the city at the 50 interchange um, because they come in and they use that. And then if we expand Dillon Drive and finally get, are we going to do a northbound exit off of the Drew Dix Parkway or are we tra moving traffic down to, um, I guess that's Platteville. Drew Dix, Dylan, Drew Dix, is it, is, it, is it going down there? Is that how they're getting onto the highway? Because, you know, we have a wild horse. We just annexed that. We have housing going up on the west side. And, you know, a lot of those people probably have to go to work somewhere. And yes. most likely Colorado Springs. So the project so. Joe, Joe mentioned about uh, Dylan and uh, uh, Drew Dix mm -hmm. is going to finish up with the diamond interchange. So 108 is a separate project. Yeah, correct. But we're we're clogging the 50 and 104 up because we're so far out on 108. So, I mean, we need all of that. I understand the need for the south side because isn't that deemed like the most dangerous part of I-25? So, yeah, we is, is that a fallacy or is that true? Is, is it the most dangerous part of I-25? along the I-25 corridor, south of- The EIS has accident of volume or accident data, right? That supports mm -hmm. those as high accident locations. Now, today, right? I mean, we're, we're 15 years or no, 10 years more uh, since we did that study. So, you know, accident data can change a little bit. So to claim today it still is, could be, right? But uh, I just don't know if the current accident data has it still- um, more so than uh, like downtown, right? There's some spots around uh, 8th Street, right? Some curves in there that are high as well. I just don't know which one is is the worst. So 15 the years passed by and the accident <laughs> right. high, it decreases over time. Right. You know? But there's still, yeah, there's a lot I mean, of because down the, there at the that curves. point that you would have thought that would have been a priority when it's the most dangerous stretch of I-25. Oh. So yeah. to answer your question about the construction money all days, um, I'm, I'm talking, I refer to FY27, the money is reachable in 2026. It does take us three, four years to get the interchange design because we have structural selection and a lot of study to be done. So the money we have kind of give us, you know, the funding to moving forward from today and, and uh, you know, be ready for, FY27 money and for construction. So it's reachable in 2026, 2026. So we can see the, the money for coming in. So the pot work, the monies are um, cover a region. Is it from Monument all the way down to the Santa Fe border? Is I mean, not Santa Fe, the New Mexico border. Correct. Yes. Is that, it's just funny to me how 
Fountain could have more money or Trinidad could have more money and better highways than a larger city like Pueblo. And, you know, I, I mean, when you were working in a pot like that, you know, I think we pay the highest gas prices, so we must pay the highest gas tax. So, but yet we don't have, we have the worst highways. And, um, you know, I'm just learning about this, but it just doesn't make sense to me. Probably it doesn't make sense to the, the, the regular person either that, you know, we have the highest gas prices. That means we're paying the highest tax and yet we have the worst highways and we're one of the larger cities. Mm -hmm. uh, in the last few years. Uh, and then other also, uh, I mean, our God, money's got to be spent somewhere. Um, how come CDOT doesn't come in and keep the highways clean in our area? I mean, they could at least clean the highways, I guess, if you don't have money to, to do construction projects here, it'd be nice. Um, I noticed that, you know, a little coalition of citizens are out on the highways cleaning up and CDOT's coming along and picking up the trash bags that they clean up. But that is just a huge um, hazard for an untrained person, an average citizen to be out along the highway cleaning it up. That The weeds, the trash, some of your homeless camps. Those would be, it'd be nice to see our, that our taxes pay out for something here in Pueblo. So I, and I've said this at PACOG, you know, um, and then, you know, uh, Richard Samora tells me to look at back at my council for those answers, because they're the ones who make a lot of these decisions, but, you know, it is your highway and we pay our taxes and we'd like to see a, a better place, you know? especially as we, we're trying to grow our population. How do we grow our population down here um, and not be able to put them on the highway to go to work? So thank you. Councilor Tencio. Just a small ask. It's not gonna cost $140 million. <laughs> I do get uh, constituents of Squall and even people from out of town, bypass, uh, bypass 50 East at the Eastern Gateway, where 47 Bypass 50 and 4th Street meet. Bypass 50 comes into town and dead ends at Bonport Boulevard, basically. What people are asking is, why don't we connect Bypass 50 contiguously to 47? Because 47 ends up with Highway 50 at uh, I-25 and make it a contiguous Highway 50. Because people come into town looking for Highway 50 at, uh, at uh, 47, and they end up at Bonport and they go, wait a minute, I'm lost. Where? How do I get to Highway 50? I want to go to Canyon City, things like that. So it might be a good idea to make it a continu to continuous highway and then turn 47 into Highway 50. See what, I'm, see, what I'm, see what I'm saying? Because, and then just make an exit to Bypass 50 and, 4th Street, off Bond of 50, Street. huh? Yeah, we will Bond Ford exit even. Yeah, you can call it that if you like. But uh, I, I have gotten people asking me that once in a while, and I'm going, well, I'll bring it up when C Doc, uh, yeah. when I get to talk to C Doc, and it would just makes a lot more sense to just continue it and have an exit to bypass 50 rather than. I don't know if we can promise, right? I, no, I, I think I'm yeah, just, I think I'm common sense that that doesn't make sense. Yeah. Don't don't be afraid to bring that up to PayCog too, right? Because it yeah. um that that's a no to to PayCog. No, no, there's see that. Actually, Larry, aren't you president of PayCog? Aren't you the president of PayCog? Yeah, yeah. That's big of planning. All right, I took a note. Um, yeah. I'll bring it up. Yeah. Yeah. Make I sense. Look, we'll, we'll take a look of, and uh, yes. when time's ready, well. And it wouldn't okay. cost a whole yes. lot either. I don't think. Right. Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Councilor Winner. Yeah, I have a question and a comment. So um, one day I was cleaning up trash at the Abriendo exit, and a friend of mine had told me that she just purchased a new Lexus. So anyway, this Lexus comes and stops, and I'm thinking it's my friend, and they're honking. So I'm thinking, oh, I probably know this person, right? 
So I walk over there and the guy rolls his window down and it's some dude I'd never seen before. And I said, yes. And he goes, you're cute. I thought, what does he think? Prostitutes are out here cleaning up trash on the highway. It was so bizarre. Um, so yeah, I agree. I don't think citizens should be out there picking up trash. Uh, I think that uh, I think all the citizens in Pueblo would like to see CDOT pick up trash from their property. Uh, we get calls all the time about that. And for years we have. Um, another thing I want to know is on the flyover, why isn't there an exit that says there's retail and restaurants right there? I mean, you're missing out on a lot of tax money. I mean, by the time, by the, I mean, by that you you pass it, it doesn't look like it um, goes to those stores. So it just seems like you could have an exit sign that says that there's retail stores there. I mean, there's Chili's and Kohl's and Dick's and. Right. You're talking about that new Dylan flyover. flyover. Yeah. Uh -huh. gotcha. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're clear down to Elizabeth going, oh, I wanted to go to those stores. And it really that exit goes to nowhere. It kind of winds clear down to the to the retail stores. So, I mean, it's a, thought, it's a program called Todd program that contact the the program and to get the you know restaurant or this sign up. So we'll we'll provide information to you to the or whoever which which retail need to have that sign and give to them. Then you call them. It's it's a commercial program. See that a contract out. Okay, so you'd have an exit sign that actually has those uh, little advertisements on there because yeah. they definitely could pull in there, stretch, you know, stretch their legs, spend some money, and then head down Elizabeth for gas. There's plenty of gas stations right there. That's fee associated with that. Does that need to contact that a commercial program? And also going um, north as well. Great. Any other questions for our CDOT friends? <laughs> okay, seeing none. Thank you so much, Ms. Hu and Mr. D. Hart for that thank information. You. Oh, you know what? I do have, sorry, well, I have one question. And I know that it's not necessarily in this region, but if you're go, I just drove to Denver. If you're, and if you're going north, there's the construction right now in Fountain. Do you know when that's going to be over? A couple of years. Probably. Okay. Oh, a couple years. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Because of the concrete of paving. Yes. Okay. Okay. It'll. It's a good. Pa it's a good uh, learning it, patience. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, they and they're do, doing quite a bit of, of reconstruction. They are. Right? They doing totally concrete. are. So it is. It's a. It's a fairly major impact to the footprint, and and, and it does it. It it causes some construction delays while, while they're getting that done. But I, they've got quite a bit of ground ready now for some concrete pavement. So they're making good progress. It's just, right, we're coming into the winter season. That's going to slow them up a little bit. So Right. It's and an it's going to, I know it's going to be beautiful and it's going to make traffic flow yeah. so much more smoothly throughout that like intersection or that little area right there. So, so, so sorry for that last minute question. Thank you, Ms. Hu and Mr. DeHart for that. Um, that then concludes the, all of the agenda topics that we have, we will pick up our, oh, sorry, Councilor Warner. I have a question for Laura. Um, is there any way we can get somebody in here to talk about Evraz? Um, you know, it's for sale. Um, there's a rumor in the community that, um, that those cranes have not moved in weeks. Um, you know, there's also rumors that the, um, Russian company, uh, as line as credit has been, has, has been disbanded. So it would be nice to get some real information. Certainly. Can of course, that. that could all be real, but at least we would hear an it. update. Yeah. We'll reach out to the administration office. Thank you. Great. We will then um, pick up our regular meeting in, in, at seven and I conclude this work session at 651.